thanks for your generosity this week. We, everything that comes in, uh, people think, oh, you know, offerings come in and um, I don't look like I've missed many meals for a while. Uh, but everything that's come in this week will go into Vanuatu. And uh, we're just about to go over there. It'll be September, actually. But there's, last time we went in there, the whole nation began to shake with the anointing. Um, in the city of 40,000, 14,000 made decisions in five nights. And we saw so many miracles happen, so many miracles. And so we, we're believing this year. Last year cost, I think, around $50, $54,000. You say, how did that come? Well, you just got to believe God. Half the time, we just uh, believe God for the money. And um, it just comes in. In fact, we've never had a crusade or a, a series of meetings anywhere in the world that the money hasn't come. I remember I was going into India, and I had three days. And I'd put in, into it somewhere around about $20,000. And you might be here tonight, you're a visitor, and... and talking about money. Well, we can't do anything without money. Pastor Mark, right now, is heading up to uh, India, Dubai, and then India, and then he's ministering up there, and you can't even get on an aeroplane without paying for the ticket. Um, you can't do anything. Over there, In uh, we've got television ads, we've got posters, we've got the stadium, we've got lights, we've got everything, and uh, it just costs money. But uh, the money comes in. I remember we had three days before a crusade and God spoke to me. And uh, I said, Lord, I don't know what we're going to do here. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to know how we're going to do this thing. And the Lord said, you're okay. It's okay. It's my problem, not yours. It's my problem, not yours. And Jackie spoke to me and she said, look, are you sure you're doing the right thing going there? The money hasn't come. We're $30,000 short. And it was Thursday and I was leaving that weekend. And I said to Jackie, look, it's God's problem. This is God's problem. And then the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to go down to the opening of this uh, retirement village. The man who, very wealthy man in Adelaide, South Australia, and um, he had put money in previously into what we're doing and loved what we're doing. And I felt the Lord say, go down to the opening of his uh, senior citizens' homes. So I went down, walked in, and I felt the power of God, and he came over to me, and he said, good to see you, mate. He said, what are you doing? Where are you going now? I said, oh, I'm going to India in a few days. And he said, have you got everything you need? And I thought, well, I'm not going to tell him too much. I said, oh, well, you're a little bit short, but, you know, God's good. And he said, look, hang on. This is my bank manager, lousy bank, great manager. And he said, uh, just wait here. And he got on the phone to his company and he came back and he said, there's something waiting for you down at the company. And so I waited for a while. I didn't want to look too hasty. And then when I was ready, I took off. I went straight down to their company, parked the car, walked in, and I said, Tim Hall. And the lady said, yes, there's something here for you, Mr. Hall. Envelope here for you. Handed me an envelope. I said, oh, thanks very much. And quietly walked outside. Then I ran to the car. <laughs> $30,000. And uh, it's happened numbers of times where you know that God is your provider. And so I wait on God. He provides. I want to thank you for being part of it, the people that get saved in Vanuatu. And we're going in to see that last year we saw it shaken. Now we want to finish the job. You are part of it now. You've invested. It's seed to your account. And it is seed to your account. Hallelujah. We're going to talk some more about healing tonight, healing in the Word, um, and we'll start where we were last night, and then we'll go from there. If you go with me, please, to the book of Luke, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Luke. There's a few in between there. Luke 4. And remember in Luke 4 that the time came for Jesus to begin his ministry on the planet, 30 years of age, and his time was right, and he was down there at the River Jordan, and there was John the Baptist baptizing, and John pointed a finger, and he said, behold, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, and then Jesus went over to him, and he said, John, baptize me. He said, no, 
It, it, he said, no, it's, it's you should baptize me. He said, no, you baptize me. This is required. I want you. You need to baptize me. And John baptized Jesus and the cloud came down and the voice out of heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Bible says immediately after he was driven by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Immediately after the blessing, driven into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. In that time, he neither ate nor drank. But in that time, the, uh, the Spirit of the Lord moved on his life and he was ready now. It was his moment. We're going to have a word of prayer right now. Father, in Jesus' name, right through this building now, we pray that you would open our hearts. I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God. I thank you for the authority that's in your word. I thank you for the power in your word. Let your word tonight be with strength, be with power. And I thank you for it now in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Yes. Amen. And so for 40 days and 40 nights, he was tempted of the devil. The Bible says he went into the wilderness in the fullness of power, in the fullness of the spirit, after 40 days, he returned in the dunamis of the Spirit. And very often, very often, the real moving of the Spirit in people's lives comes after some real testing and trying. Uh, some of the great people of history went through great trials before they actually were released. It doesn't mean we have to. I think we can start praying for people as soon as we're born again. How many believe that? But in breaking into the fullness of ministry, people like Oral Roberts and Catherine Kuhlman and many of the great preachers of the past went through great trials. Cho Yong-gi, Dr. Yong-gi Cho from Korea, battled through tuberculosis. Uh, Oral Roberts, great healing evangelist, also had tuberculosis. Both of them dying. Spirit of God raised them up. They fought through using the Word of God. Kenneth E. Hagan, he was also faced with a situation similar and God gave him a revelation lying on his sickbed that if we confess uh, or basically if we have faith as a grain of mustard seed, we'll say to this mountain, get up and move and go into the sea. And if we doubt not but believe uh, in our heart that what we say will come to pass, we'll have whatsoever we say. And he began to speak to his mountain and he began to take authority under the pressure. He began to press through. I've discovered that the pressures we face are often... Through that time, we grow into the authority. We learn to break through the circumstances and situations that come against us. And we grow in authority. I wrote a book called Giant Killers. And I talked about that book that every giant we face and bring it down, we step into another dimension of authority. Every situation we struggle with and press through and break through and take hold of, takes us into a place where somewhere down here we grow into a greater dimension of authority in the Spirit, a greater dimension where we have power to break through. Jesus came back in the dunamis of the Spirit and He began His ministry. And we know that as He began to move, people marveled and they said, what word is this? For with authority He speaks. And the demons come out. First thing they noticed, they said, what a word is it? What word is this? There's something about his word. There's something in his words. There's authority. And in the spirit realm, the spirit dimension, the dimension of darkness, knows whether our words are alive with authority or whether they're just words. The sons of Sceva said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And the demon said, Jesus, I know. The demon said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you? Who are you? And the demons know if we know him. The demons know if we're hoping, bluffing, or whether we really know who we are in Christ. Amen. And so they're all amazed, and everywhere he went, they were marveling and saying, who is this man? What is this authority? What is this power? What is this authority? I want to I look tonight at some of the miracles in the Bible and uh, some of the different things that happened in the miraculous. But 
to begin with, I want you to go to Acts 14. Acts chapter 14. And it's quite practical because this piece of scripture opens up a whole lot of stuff about praying for the sick, about ministry to the sick. Acts 14. Chapter 14, verse 1. And there's some absolute keys in every one of the miracles in the Bible. There are incredible keys that we can learn from. We could open up a dozen of the miracles tonight and pull them apart and find the keys in every one that relate to the miraculous. Can I put a challenge to you? Get your Bible and find all the miracles in the Gospels and the book of Acts. And uh, I've suggested that people do this. If you have an old Bible, and uh, you can't really recommend that people cut Bibles up, but maybe photocopy some pages, the pages with the miracles. And then cut that miracle, that section of the miracle out and put it in the middle of a sheet, a large sheet of paper. And then start going through that and pulling it apart. Circle everything in it that you feel jumps out to you the things that uh, for example when Jesus came back to the house where he lived or he was living with he found that the place was absolutely jam-packed uh, in Luke 5 and the Bible says um, the power of the Lord was present to heal them so I'd circle that I look at the miracles then it talks about men acting their faith I'd circle that Jesus seeing their faith circle that and every significant phrase I could find circle it and then get in the Greek language and start pulling the words apart and writing the meanings of some of these words down from the Greek language. And then start writing comments about these points that you've circled. Ask God, say, give me revelation on this point and write it down. And then find a script, part of the scripture that this bounces out at me. Start to write comments about it and cover that whole page with your comments. Then when you're finished, take this scrambled mind map that you've produced and pull it apart and then put it systematically in order and you'll find that you've got sermons on the miracles. And do it with every one of the miracles and God will give you keys in every one. Every one of them. Even some of the miracles that are in more than one of the Gospels, you'll find little differences. For example, we're talking the other night about the little woman, no I haven't preached on it, the little woman touching the hem of the garment. In one it says he touched the clothes in Matthew, it says, who's Jewish? He touched the cruspidon, the blue tassel at the hem of the garment that spoke of the unchanging nature of God and his word. We may look at that in a couple of minutes. Just have a glance at that. But one is saying he touched the clothes. The other one says he touched the statement of the unchanging nature of God and his word. And you go, wow, let me study this cruspidon, this tassel. Let me study the hem of the garment. Jesus, little woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment. And so I'm going to do a study, and I haven't got yet to act, so keep your finger there, but I'll do a study on the hem of the garment. Because Matthew says he touched, she touched the hem, she touched the craspidon. But the hem of the garment in the ancient world was the place of authority. The hem of the garment around the base of the garment was the statement of a king's power often woven with gold and, and precious stones and, and uh, very, very valuable bindings around the hem of the garment, extremely valuable and so powerful and significant that that great man, general, governor or king could lift up his robe and take the hem of that garment, press it into clay as his own seal. And so when, when the little woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment she touched the statement of his dominion and you start studying the hem and you follow this through and you study and you find that David went into a cave and found Saul asleep and he cut the hem of the garment and the next day he held it up he held up this magnificent thing from the base of his garment that spoke of his kingly dominion and held it up and said I've got the statement of your kingly dominion, I've got it now. And he became repentant because it was not his time. And he had no right to do that. 
And so when you start to look at that and you see the little woman touching the hem of his garment, she's touching his nature, she's touching his authority, she's touching his power, she's touching the, the nature of the one by whom the whole earth was created for him and by whom all things hold together. She's touching the nature of him who was the express image of God, stamped as it were with a signet ring into human flesh. She's touching the unchanging one. She's touching the great physician. She's touching the one in all power and all authority. She's touching the hem of him who's able to do exceedingly abundant beyond anything you could ask or think according to the power that's at work within us. She was touching his authority. And you start to study these little things. Just the hem opens another world. And you lay this thing down there and you pull it apart. And by the end of it, suddenly you're in revelation and sermons and the sermons become more and more full and then you add to it and you take that thing and you get illustrations and you find stories of your own that relate to some of these things here and you put them together until you've every one of the miracles starts to build until you're writing your own book but i want to look at this because here's some keys every one of the miracles has extraordinary keys Extraordinary. Before I go there again, what about in John 9 where Jesus came to the blind man? The man was blind. Jesus walked past him. The disciples said, why is he blind? Did he sin? Jesus said, no, this is for the glory of God. And Jesus got down on his hands and knees, spat on the ground and made mud. He put the mud into his eyes, made of spittle and dirt, and then said, go down to the pool of Siloam and wash your eyes. And I looked at that, I said, God, I had it. let me pull this thing apart. Speak to me from this piece of scripture. And I started to look at it and I thought, why would Jesus spit on the ground and make mud? Why? Why would... Why wouldn't he have just said, be healed? Instead of that, he starts to spit on the ground. And you have to spit a few times to get some mud together. It's not one spit. He's then spitting on the ground, spitting on the ground. Stirs it with his finger, makes mud, stuffs it into his eyes. Now, we've made a lot of, you know, that's a, you can preach a funny message about that. He's walking down the hill and people are saying, great mud pack, you know. Here's mud in your eye. There's a whole lot. But why? And I started to say, God, give me some secrets out of this piece of Scripture. Give me some secrets out of this. Can you show me some keys? Why did he spit? And I thought about it. I thought, here's this beggar sitting there every day. And people hate the beggars. And they're tripping over him. I wonder how many hundred times he'd gone home with his faith covered in spit as they cursed him. You foul beggar, spat in his face. And then kicked up the dust and made clay. And he'd go home with his face covered with mud and clay from the people that hated him and cursed him. But Jesus turned those same two substances around and blessed him. But I thought further, maybe the guy didn't have any sockets, any eyes in his sockets. Who knows? I think Jesus just demonstrated again that he can take clay and make life. He took clay and made a man. He can take clay and make an eye. But I was thinking more about it. And I thought, if you get arrested and they want to get your DNA, they'll take the thing and... I'm not talking from experience, I've seen it on TV. <laughs> and take a dose of your spit and it's got your DNA. Have you ever thought that that man walked down the road with the very DNA of Jesus in his eyes? The very DNA of Christ in his eyes. Then the Lord said, go down there and wash at the Pool of Siloam. That was miles. That was a fair walk down a long... I, I was in 
Jerusalem a couple of years ago. It's a long walk from up there in that area down to the Pool of Siloam. That's a big walk. That's a walk of faith. But Jesus put this in his eyes and said, go down there and watch. There's a test of faith there. Faith is active. How many believe that? I'll be writing down, hey, faith is active. Faith's action. And he took off down the road with his eyes filled with mud to the pool of Siloam. What does that mean? What does Siloam mean? Scent. The pool of scent. The scent one. The Holy Spirit. It's very interesting. On the great day of the feast, we read the story of the great day of the feast. When Jesus was incognito there at the great feast of tabernacles and at the peak of it when the the thing with the worship had reached the pinnacle the high priest took water from the pool of Siloam which means sent and began to pour it onto the altar as an offering from the pool of Siloam was sent speaking of the outpouring of the spirit the water from the pool of Siloam is an absolute type and picture of the Holy Spirit. And so you have the picture here of clay, the very touch and DNA of Jesus and the finishing touch of the Holy Spirit. And in healing, there's the need of the man, the dirt, the DNA of Jesus and the operation of the Holy Spirit, the name of Jesus. And his fullness is in the name. And the power of the Holy Spirit and the guy's eyes popped open. Every one of the miracles has little keys that as you look at them, you go, man, there's something in that that I can grasp. For example, the centurion. His servant was lying at home critically ill. Critically ill. He sent some of the workers from the synagogue down. This was a hardened centurion. He sent workers from the synagogue down. They came down to Jesus and they said, this guy's worthy. He's building a synagogue. Yes, he's a Roman centurion, but he's building a synagogue. He thought, no, no, no. And he came down and he said, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of anything. I'm not worthy that you even come under my door. I'm not worthy that you come through the door. But I too am a man under authority. And I can see the authority that you have in the spirit realm. I can see that as I speak, All of Rome backs me that when you speak, there's a dimension of the Spirit that backs you. And I'm not even worthy you come under my roof, but say in a word, and I know my servant will be healed. Instantly, the servant's healed. But Jesus virtually said to them, this is what I've been looking for. I haven't seen this. I haven't seen this from all the Jews. I haven't seen it. Now I'm hearing it from a centurion. I'm hearing it from this man. Because he understood. And you start to look at that. He understood the authority in the realm of the Spirit. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that. When the great storm rose up in the boat, he stood up at the front and rebuked the storm and the storm stopped. Later on, he sent them over again. He said, you row over. And he walked past. And there was a little storm. It wasn't as serious. It was a storm that was just strong enough to keep the boat from going. And they were rowing until their hands were blistered. And Jesus came walking past. And it says he would have walked right on past. But Peter called out to him. What did Jesus want them to do? I think he wanted them to stand up to the front of the boat, rebuke the wind and get across there. I think it was a test for them. And then with the fig tree, in the last week of his life, Jesus cursed that fig tree. 24 hours later, Peter and John said, Lord, the fig tree you cursed is dead from the roots. Jesus said, have the God kind of faith. I've been trying to teach you. It's in the power of your words. Have the God faith. Every one of the miracles is going to unlock to you little things that you take them on board and they become part of your understanding. So let's go to Acts 14. Have a look at the story here. Let's open this up tonight. 
The Bible says, verse 14, it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together under the, into the synagogue of the Jews and they so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore they abode, they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony out of the word of His grace and granted them signs, wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. When there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them. They were aware of it, and they fled into Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, into the region that lies round about. And there they preached the gospel. Now let's look at this for a couple of minutes. There they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who, steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leapt and he walked. And so on. When the people saw it, what they had done, they lifted up their voices, crying out, These are gods. They were calling him Jupiter and Mercury. And eventually, eventually they stoned them for the miracle. But here's an incredible picture to us of ministering to someone that needs a healing. Scripture says here that they had left Iconium and they'd come down to the district of Lystra and Derbe. And the Bible starts off with verse 7. And if you want to circle this, there they preached the gospel. There they preached the gospel. Again and again, you'll find that they preached not just the gospel, but the gospel of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom. What is the good news of the kingdom? It's the good news of a king who is in authority in every realm. It's the good news of the fact that he is king over disease, king over devils, king over darkness, king over sin. He is king. He's in dominion. He's the ruler. When we preach the kingdom of God, we're preaching Christ, the king who is in dominion. He's in dominion tonight. He's the king who is in authority. They preach the gospel of the kingdom, the greatness of the kingdom of God, a kingdom that shall not be shaken, a kingdom that cannot be moved, a kingdom of might, a kingdom of majesty, a kingdom of dominion, talked of right back in Daniel and with the prophets. And he was preaching. Something happens when you preach the word. How many believe something happens with the word? The word is living. I shared yesterday what the Bible says about the Word. The Bible says the Word is sharp and it's active. It's living. There's nothing like this book. This is a living book. This book is actually alive. When the Holy Ghost takes hold of it, the Bible says He broods over it to make it happen. He broods over His Word. This thing is living. It's alive. It's sharp. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Cutting the fine line between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. That's, that's microsurgery, even to the discerning of the thoughts of the human heart. It's microsurgery. I was in the Solomon Islands, and uh, I was in my hotel room in the Solomons. And we, we were in two rooms looking out over Savo Bay, where there's more American ships were sunk out there. I think there were six major ships, American and the... Australian flagship, the Canberra, went down in one night out there. And there's ships out there so close, they went down, they're touching on the bottom. It's, that's why they call it Iron Bottom Sound. But I was looking out there, it was evening. I was going to go and preach later that night. The sun was going down and there was the smell of the hibiscus and the sound of the cicadas. And we we're about to go down to the meeting and a guy in the next room looked across and he said, Tim Hall. I said, yes, it is. He said, oh, I've got to tell you a story. I said, okay, I want to hear it. He said, can you come over just for a few minutes? I said, well, I'm just about to leave in a minute, but yeah, I'll come over. And I went over to his room and he said, I've got to tell you this. He said, I'm, I am so excited about this. He said, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor that was expanding at such a rate it was going to kill me. 
was going to take me out. He said, I went to the doctor and I had all these problems and I went to the specialists and he said, I was diagnosed with this serious, aggressive thing in my brain, this big tumour, growth in my brain. And the doctor said, if we don't take it out, you're going to die. But he said, if, if we do take it out, the chances are possibly, and it's 50-50 maybe, I don't know what the percentage was, the chances are fairly strong that after it's removed, you will be blind. And he said, well, let me go away to a beach house for a while and I'll go and I'll, I, I just want to go for two weeks. And the doctor said, you need to get this ASAP. He said, give me two weeks. I'm going away. I'll go to a house down on the beach. I'll pray and I'm going to spend some time with God because I want him to step in. So he went down to the beach. When he got down there, he opened up the word of God and he began to read the word. He began to study the word, everything he could find on healing, every miracle. He went back into Exodus 15, 26. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am your physician. If he's your physician, he's your brain surgeon. If he's your physician, he's your psychiatrist. If he's your physician, he is your kidney specialist. If he is your physician, he is your throat specialist. If he is your physician, he is your lung surgeon specialist. And he began to read the word of God and speak the word of the Lord. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And, and uh, the promise that God would take all manner of sickness out from their midst. And he read that there was not one weak and insipid and feeble among their ranks as they went through the wilderness. And he read Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget one of all of his great blessings who forgives all your, your, your iniquities and heals all your diseases. Restores you like the eagle. He began to read the promises, promises of healing and miracles. And then, of course, into... Scripture after Scripture, Isaiah 53, how who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I love that. He says, if you believe the report, I'll bear my arm on your behalf. He talks about Jesus. He had no form nor commonness that we should desire him. We esteemed him smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The well-being of our peace was upon him. And by his wounds we were healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. But the Lord has laid upon him the sin of the whole human race with all of its evil consequences and so on and so on. Matthew 8, 16 and 17, they brought at evening all that were sick and possessed with devils and he healed them all and cast out the devils that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah saying himself bear our disease and carry our pain and he read the scripture who has believed our report and he said God I believe the report Amen. scripture after scripture feeding on it chewing it the Bible says meditate on the word meditate on it because it's life to them that find it. Health to all their flesh. That's every bit of our flesh. That's brain, kidneys, lungs, heart, circulation. The word is life to them that find it. Health to all their flesh. And he fed on the word. 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 He spoke the word. He muttered the word. He meditated on it day and night. At the end of two weeks, he went back to the doctor. And the doctor said, we're preparing you for surgery. And they took him in. This guy's a businessman, big, serious businessman in Adelaide, South Australia. And they took him in. And they said, what's going to happen is you go into surgery. We're going to remove a section of skull. We're going to remove this um, and you'll find your head is bound up by the end in recovery. We're going to cover your eyes. We're not sure if you'll have your sight afterwards or not. But we'll bind up your eyes for a couple of days and then we don't want you to have any shock or anything in the beginning. We'll just leave that and we're going to give that a couple of days. And Well, he woke up in the recovery room and he had bandages on his head. But his eyes were wide open and everything looked perfect. 
And a few minutes later, the doctor came in. He was now recovered. He'd come through the anaesthetic and he'd been in that recovery room. The doctor walked in, came into him and tears began to run down this doctor's face. And the doctor said, I have never seen anything like what's happened to you. I've never seen anything like what has taken place in your life. He said, we opened up your skull and when we opened up and went in, someone had been in before us. And, the, and he left his mark. It was suturing unlike any doctor on the planet can do. He just left stitch marks so precise and detailed that there's not a surgeon on the earth could do that. He said, the greatest surgeon that ever lived went in before us. <laughs> greatest surgeon that ever lived went in before us. There's something about the power of the Word of God. Isaiah 55, I shared it last night. Isaiah 55 says to us, As the rain comes down from heaven and the snow and waters the earth, and the earth brings forth, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It's an accomplishing word. Accomplishing word. As we speak it, something starts to happen. Something starts taking place. Something just uh, find something here for a moment. I shared Hebrews 4 with you yesterday. Hebrews 4.12. We were just talking there. If I can find Hebrews 4. The Word of God is quick. Someone say it's quick. Someone say it's sharp. Do you believe it? Do you believe it's sharp? Do you believe it cuts? Bible calls it the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. And the Bible says it's sharp and it's quick and it's powerful. Very powerful. That word energia, active, operative. Bullishly powerful in strength. And it's sharp. It's razor sharp. It's so sharp, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. I talked yesterday and I said the word two-edged is the word dystomos. From two words, dis and stomos. Uh, dis, two, stomos, mouth. Sharper than any two-mouth sword. We have a two-mouth sword. It's two-edged, but it's two-mouth. One is the mouth of God speaking the word to us, and the other is us speaking it back. See, the, the Bible says in the, in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 10, and reading from verse 23, it says, uh, Hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering. Hold fast the profession. The word hold fast, kata echo, comes from two words, kata, down, echo to seize hold, take hold, kata echo. Hold fast the profession of your mouth. The word profession is the Greek word homologia, from two words, homo the same, logia word. Hold fast to speaking the same word. Not what your emotions say or the symptoms say, but hold fast to what God says. To what God says. Hold fast to what God says. The Bible says that Jesus is the high priest of our profession. What does that mean? He's the high priest of our homologia. Of our saying the same word. When the pressure comes on. And sickness comes. We can choose to say, hey, this thing's going to take me out. Or hey, by his wounds I was healed. It was not in vain. Someone said, how do I know the will of God for me in healing? How do I know it's the will of God to heal me? A man came to Jesus one day and said, if you're willing, you can heal me. And Jesus said, I am willing. Be whole. But you know, you ask the question, is it the will of God? Was it the will of God for us to be saved? How do we know? When was that established? When he hung on the cross. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. It's done. It's done. How do we know that's His will? Do we know it's His will for us to be saved? Yes. And by His wounds we were? We were healed. We are healed. When was the will of God for healing established? When He was tied to that that posed and scourged 
until the flesh hung from his back and there by those wounds he purchased healing. Plus he's never changed. When he declared in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord that healeth thee, nowhere else did he say, hey, I used to be, but I've changed now. It says in the book of Malachi 3, verse 6, I am God, I change not. Numbers 23, 19 says, God's not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Have I not said it? Will I not do it? If God says it, he'll do it. Kate, he'll do it. If he says it, He'll do it. Let every man be a liar and God be true. Because not a man that he should lie. There's only one liar and that's the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. When God said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Forget not my benefits. I forgive all your iniquities and heal all your diseases. He meant it. But we've got to speak it. He says... Hold fast to the profession of your mouth. Hold fast to the declaration. He is my healer. He is my miracle worker. He is the God of promise. All the promises of God are in him. Yes and amen. You could get excited about this. Now I just lost where I was. Word of God. The Bible says in Jeremiah, it's a hammer. The Word of God's a hammer. It's a hammer that'll break up. It'll break the rock of the biggest opposition to our lives. It'll break the rock of every hindrance. It'll break the rock. It'll smash every hindrance. It'll crush hindrances. It's a fire. It'll burn out disease. It'll burn out devils. It'll make it so hot they can't stay round. The night I was saved, let me tell you, the night I got saved, I was 27, 26, 27 years of age. It's, just, it's over 40 years now. 41 years. So that must be 1974, I think. 20, 40, 42 years, whatever it was. I remember sitting up the back and I was telling some people today that Back there at that point, I used to, as a school teacher, and I would go to the bar at lunchtime and line up the shots of tequila, and it was nothing to have four or five or more shots of tequila at lunchtime, follow it up with a whiskey and then probably a pint of beer just to soften things up and then go back and teach school. That was every day of the week. That was every day of the week. That was every school day. And then after school, I'd go down there and line them up again and drink till closing and go home smashed every night of the week, every day. I drank lunchtime. I drank after school. Went home at the weekend and uh, drank ethyl alcohol, 100% proof. Used to drink it out of a thimble and uh, sit around painting and talking to people and artists and working in a blacksmith shop and half the time full as a boot for years, road accident, smashed my car, sunk into a swamp one night. I'd been dead by 30 years of age, 35 years of age I'd been dead if Jesus hadn't stepped in. And the night I was saved, I sat in the back row of a church. I was sitting right up in the very back of the church and the preacher preached and I didn't like what he preached. I didn't like him. Maybe people here tonight don't like me. I didn't like him. Didn't like what he preached. Sat right in the back row, minding my own business. And he kept preaching at me and kept pointing up my way and I wanted to get out of there. But I remember he got to the end and he, my, I was shaking like a leaf because something was happening to me that was supernatural. And the Word of God was doing something and the Word of God was shaking me. Something in that atmosphere was shaking me. The Word of God. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. And that Word of God was stirring something up in me that had never been stirred before in my life. Something was happening as the Word of God was coming that was shaking me to the depths of my foundations. And I remember at the back of the room, totally transformed, shaken, and ready to launch into a whole new life because of the power of the Word. I didn't like the preacher. 
And he said, if you want to give your life to Jesus, lift up your hand. I thought, I don't want you to see it. I don't want you to see it at all. And then I, he said, yes, young man, I see your hand up in the back row. But I wasn't going to get in the front. I was not going to get into the front of that building. It wasn't a chance. I sat back there and I thought, and people started to get in the front. He had us all standing. He said, Go down the, come to the, if, you, if you want to give your life to Jesus, come down to the front. I thought, no way. No way that that's going to happen. And then I felt a hand on my shoulder. I was in the back row of that church. And every now and again when I'm preaching, if I'm out there and there's 30,000 people or 40,000 people I'm preaching, very often I'll feel him come alongside and I'll feel his hand on my shoulder again. And every time the miracles break out en masse. My legs took over and went into rebellion. I wasn't going to go. My legs rebelled. I said, legs, where are you going? <laughs> legs, you idiots. Legs. Where are you going, Legs. When your legs go, you haven't got much choice but follow them. And I got down to the front and the pastor had been praying. And God said, I'm going to give you, like Paul had a young man, a Timothy. I'm going to give you a young man and I want you to build into his life. And I want you to put something into his life. But as I was walking down, I want to tell you, I felt like birds flying out of me. I felt the power of God. I felt the word had cut loose every bird in there. The word of God had cut these birds loose. And now as I walked down, in obedience, they no longer held me. The word of God had cut them like a sharp two-edged sword, cut them like a knife. The word of God cuts. It'll cut the ropes. It'll cut the chains. You say, did you, were you perfect immediately? Well, I went from tequila to beer. And then after that, I got picked up on the breathalyzer by the police. And I said, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I'm still drinking a fair bit of beer, but something real was happening in my life, and I'd given away the tequila. And, I, and they said, blow into this thing, and it all blew. They said, we're bringing the blood alcohol people out here. And I said, look, I'm a Christian. I've just given my life to Christ, and, and I love Jesus, and I know that I've been done the wrong thing, but can you let me run around the block? No, we can't, sir. And they started to like me, but I remember the blood alcohol people came, and they said, blow into this machine. I blew into the machine and they started to get really mad. They said, we don't know why we're called out here. It's registering zero. And uh, I thought, God, you got me out of that one. And uh, I don't need the stuff anymore. I don't need it anymore. I don't need it anymore. You see, Paul was preaching the word. And if we're going to minister to the sick then we've got to stir faith with the knowledge of the word. So I've got homework for you. I want you to go through your Bible. Who, I don't know what sort of Bible software you use or whether you've got a huge Strong's Exhaustive Concordance book. When I first used to preach years ago, all we had was our Strong's Exhaustive and we'd have our suitcase with a book about that big that weighed about half a ton to get the words to... Now we got the, I, I, most of the time traveling, I've just got eSword and a couple of things on my phone that I use. I've got Logos on my computer, but I usually just have some uh, Bible aids on my phone that help me. But look up the word healing and healings and healed and write down every one of the words and give a bit of space around them and ask God to give you a revelation on every piece of scripture where the word healed, healing, healings comes and write them down on one side there and on the other side write your revelation on that piece of scripture um, he sent forth his word and healed them at evening they brought all that were diseased and those bound with demons and he cast out the demons with his word with his word and he healed them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet go back to Isaiah the prophet Isaiah 53, who has believed our report? Whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Just take every word on healing um, and just pull them apart. Jot your notes down. Do a study of every word, every one. Fill a book. Do a word study. Say, what am I going to read in the word today? Do a word study. Do a word study on power. Do a word study on authority. Do a word study on dominion. And start filling pages until every one of these words 
Every one of these words begin to jump out as you read them and you get an understanding of every one of them and you find them all over the place and you, suddenly the book starts to come alive and, and as you're reading, there's a power that comes with it and then as you talk to people and preach, there'll be a manifestation of faith and power as you minister the word. The Bible says he broods over his word to make it happen. And so the first thing here is, going back to chapter 14 of Acts, the scripture says, that there he preached the word. He was preaching the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet. Luke loves to give you some details. Impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, never had walked. So he'll tell you everything about him. So here's a guy whose feet have never worked. He's been crippled from the mother's womb. He's never walked. But the man is listening to the Word of God. He's sitting there listening to the Word of God. The same heard Paul speak. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. He's hearing Paul preach. And the Bible says here, let's have a look at it for a couple of moments. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving. Who was steadfastly beholding? Paul was. Right? He heard Paul speak, who, steadfastly beholding him. The word for steadfastly beholding him is the Greek word eitonizo. Another place where you'll read that word is when Jesus was taken in the clouds and the disciples were steadfastly beholding, watching him go. Like this. Awestruck. Jesus has gone in a cloud, steadfastly beholding. This guy... Paul has been preaching and as he's preaching and suddenly he he looks at this guy and he begins to go, God's about to do something here. And he starts watching this guy, watching every move. He's looking for something. He's seeing something. He's looking. He sees something on this young man. He keeps preaching. But he's watching. And in that crowd, he's watching one person particularly. You know, when we preach, we're looking for something. When we're preaching... We ought to be looking and watching. I've watched people here in this building. Some are very enthusiastic. Some indifferent. Some fired, stirred up. Some leaning forward going, I want more of the word. But you look around when you're preaching and you watch every person in the building. No one in the building I haven't missed that I've missed and you watch faces and you're watching what God's doing you're watching where they're at you're watching for hunger you're looking for hunger every now and again you find people that basically when when Jesus was preaching in that room full of Pharisees some of them were there to kill him some of them were there to oppose him some were there to find fault others were there curious When you're preaching to a big crowd of people, you've got an absolute mixture of people there. And one of the great things when you're ministering is to watch what's happening, to watch people's faces, watch their eyes, watch their body language, watch where they're at, watch for levels of excitement. You can start to see faith. You can see faith. You can see it in someone's eyes. You can generally tell when you pray for someone whether they're going to get their miracle. The eyes, the window of the soul. And so Paul was watching for something, looking for something, waiting for something, preaching for something. I think as preachers, we're preaching to a point where we know that this is the right moment for things to happen. And we watch. You watch individuals. Sometimes you're watching and someone's so excited, you've got to pray for them almost a or they're going to burst. Sometimes you can just sort of sense. Sometimes people get healed. I was in a meeting one night, and this lady started yelling out. Started to yell out. And I thought, what is she yelling? What's wrong with this woman? Is she a bit mental or something? What's wrong with her? And she was yelling out. And I said to one of the guys, can you just find out what's going on? Hadn't spoken for 12 months got a miracle sitting under the word 
got a miracle sitting under the word. Got her miracle sitting under the word, just sitting in the place. Suddenly it can happen. You know, in, in Acts 10, as the word was being preached, suddenly the Holy Ghost fell on them. Suddenly without warning. Bang! On the day of Pentecost, suddenly without warning. You can be in a meeting sometimes and people just, the Spirit of God just take that meeting over and people just, things happening right through that building. Steadfastly, etanizo, steadfastly beholding, watching, 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 watching. When's he ready? When's he ready? I think there's a moment when a person is ripe to get their miracle. And very often we pray for them when they're not really ready. I think there's a timing in the miraculous. Jesus said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I'll tell you a story. You okay? Yeah. I was in New Zealand. I was preaching in New Zealand. I was over there in a, a city called Hastings in New Zealand. A number of years ago, I was a pretty new preacher. Nervous. Very uncertain of myself, but getting opportunities to preach and God was helping me it was fantastic it was in the early days and I went to a church and we had a massive crowd of 60 people at their crusade and I preached my heart out I went for it I had a red tie on I looked like an evangelist I was preaching preaching <coughs> did everything got to the end no one got saved I thought I better have an altar call so I called all these people a whole bunch of people came down for healing I prayed for the first one and it was as dead as anything. It was like trying to pray for the wall there. And I prayed for the next one and there's just no receiving. And I think some lady said, I've been prayed for by this preacher and that preacher and, and that preacher. And you can go ahead and do your best, see if you can do okay. <laughs> I've had people say that when I was a young guy. Now they say it to me, I say, well, you won't need me. No worries. Get it yourself then, you're, you're right. So would you say that? Yeah, I would. Yeah, they would. I'm not going to try and get Jesus to dance for someone, to prove something. God responds to faith, not challenge. And some people come out to challenge him and dare him to try and heal them. Some people come out for prayer for a bit of attention because they don't get any attention. And they actually like the attention and they're not worried about the miracle, but they love that bit of attention. Some people come with hope. Others come with raw faith. Some come desperate, ready to receive. Others, I've been prayed for so many times, I might as well try it again, but I'm not expecting anything. Some of the hardest people to pray for are Pentecostals who have been around a long time. Been prayed for by everybody and know it all because un unbelief has stepped in in such a measure that it's all the outward appearance of faith, but really underneath it's just a whole pack of unbelief. And almost a dislike of God and a blaming of God. God's got me into this state. I'm coming tonight and he better get me out of it. Defying him. I went down that line. It was as dead, as dead, as dead, as dead. Got down to the end and suddenly I had this really clear word of knowledge about this guy that he'd been injured playing rugby, he damaged these vertebrae in his neck, and I'm thinking, what happened all the rest of the way down here? Got down there, and this guy was wide open. He's ready to receive, laid hands on him. Power of God sent him about three rows. <laughs> and he was excited, healed, and I was, praise God. I went home, and the pastor and I sat down, and I said to him, uh, well, I wasn't very good tonight, was I? He said, well, I've been in meetings that were... Uh, it wasn't the greatest I've been in. But I said, but that bloke got healed. He said, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Seven o'clock the next morning, the phone rings. And it's this guy. He's jumping around all over the place. He's had his miracle. 
And uh, he, said, he, he said to me, I've, I've had this miracle. I, I'm healed by the power of God. I said, fantastic, brother. That's great, brother. That's great. And he said, I'm so excited. I rang a friend of mine last night, and I told him you're coming over today, and uh, you're going to raise him up. I said, what? You, what? He said, I said, what happened to him? He said, a truck crushed him against a wall, rolled back, crushed him against the wall, crushed his spine. He's, got, he's, he, he's bent double and he's got one leg shorter than the other. You know, and and, and he, said, he said, I told him you'd come over this morning at 10 o'clock and raise him up. I thought, you idiot. What? Just take your healing and just don't do stupid things. <laughs> just, just don't be so stupid. And he said, I've talked to the pastor. He's br-. I, I said, oh, what? They're ganging up now. And I felt I wanted to run home. I could almost hear mummy calling me. And I tried to, you know, give an air that I was a man of God. But I tell you, I was not man's God of God's man of, pa- of faith and power. I was God's man of paste and flour. You're all okay. I'm just going on. You all right? Okay. Well, we finished tonight, so we might as well. Uh, is this a help? Yes. yes. All right. Good. 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 So, anyway, we went over to the house, and I thought, I want to run. Honestly, I thought, I want to get out. I genuinely thought, leave me alone. We had a miracle last night. Please, can we be satisfied with that? I genuine. We went in the house and she said, oh, Lee's been in terrible pain, on pain-killing injections the whole time. And I thought, great. And I went and sat down up in the other room. And uh, the other pastor was a funny guy. He, he was seeing me like, a, like I was in the lion's den. And he didn't care. He thought it was pretty humorous <laughs> to see me suffering. He, he was enjoying seeing me. He was enjoying it. The lady said, I'll go and get Lee. She went and got him, brought him down. Well, if I thought my imagination was bad relating to Lee, when I saw him, the imagination was nothing. He was bent double, and they eased him into a chair, and he was just about howling with pain. And I went, oh, God, help me, please. I felt even too much for God. I thought, Lord, you're on your own here. And I sat down and I thought, where do you start? I'd never seen anything like this. Never seen anything like it. You're going to confront some situations like this where you'll feel the same. You'll feel the same. You feel inadequate. You feel void of the presence of God. It's like, where's God? God who? Where? Where? <laughs> like God's gone on holidays or something. I just felt nothing. And I looked at him and I, oh, I can't look at him. And I said, Lee, Lee, number one, I'm not the healer. I thought, I'll get that out of the way and put the responsibility, which is not really true. Jesus said, take my word and take my power and heal the sick. I went, oh God, okay. Right, and I said, I'll just tell you what the Bible says. So I started quoting scriptures. And I was telling him the same stuff we are reading before and, and uh, by his wounds we're healed and talking about the miracles and talking about the God who's the God of the impossible is anything too difficult with me and and I'm quoting scripture and I'm and I shared a couple of stories and I didn't look at him I, I, a couple of little glances but it was terrible and then all of a sudden I looked up and his eyes were like this and I looked into his eyes and just like Paul I perceived that the word had worked I think there's a moment when the Word of God has quickened faith to a place where the person is ready now to receive. There's a moment. Sometimes, sometimes you've got to share with a person for a fair while till you see something rise. Sometimes you witness to someone and you feel nothing for 10 minutes and all of a sudden their eyes change and you realize that you've struck something in the spirit and they're ready and they're coming to a place where you can sense that it's about to be a finished thing. 
And healing's the same. And sometimes we pray for people when they're in hope, not in faith. And if we're praying for them in hope, we actually will reinforce unbelief because God does not respond to hope. He responds to faith. He doesn't respond to needs. You say, that sounds like heresy. Jesus did not respond to needs. He was surrounded by needs. But he said, I do what the Father tells me to do. Do you remember the pool of Bethesda? All those thousands sitting around that pool? How many did he go to? Wow. Oh. He crossed to the Gadarenes for one. Other times he sat with the multitudes. Sometimes he picked out one person in the crowd and responded under the word of the Father. The guy at the gate, beautiful. Peter and John raised him up. Peter, silver and gold have we none, such as we have you give you, we give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. How many times did Jesus walk past that man? How many times had Jesus walked past the man at the gate beautiful who sat there every day for years? At the same gate. Jesus walked past him many, many times. But on no occasion was there faith in that man reaching out to be healed, nor did the Father say, Look upon him. But Peter and John walked there on a certain day much later. And Peter looked upon him. And then he said to the man, look on us. And the man had expectation. Expecting to get something. And then Peter, who must have walked past him many, many times, looked at him and now he's got that attention. Silver and gold I don't have, but i got something for you. In the name of Jesus, rise up. And the man jumped up and leapt and walked because it was the right moment. Sometimes with people, I remember a lady came into one of our meetings, and I will come back to this story. I still haven't finished the story about the guy with the back. Remind me to get back there. I'll go, I'll go there. I'll go back. So I looked at him in this room and I could see in his eyes that he was ready. That this was the moment. I wasn't praying for someone that was hoping. I could see in his eyes this is the moment. We can pray for people with hope. But there's the moment when we pray for them and they have blistering faith that's the role as a preacher our role as a preacher is to preach the word in such a way that we cause faith to rise Bosworth said I'm not here to entertain you but to bring you to a place with my preaching where you can laugh at the impossible what is our role as a preacher it is to inspire faith and bring people to a place where they will laugh at the impossible I looked him in the eye and saw that this guy Lee was ready. Reached down, took him by the hand, and I said, Lee, stand up on your feet. And he struggled up on his feet. I said, no, no, stand up on your feet. And his back cracked and he stood bolt upright. And we prayed for him, his leg. Now, I, the leg extending thing was something that I had seen some pretty funny stuff done, and so I avoided it, but I sat him down and prayed, and I watched his leg grow to normal size. Every member of the family was saved, and the crowds in those meetings went from 60 to 600 in three nights. But I went and saw another lady who was in a wheelchair, and she was crippled, very similar at home. I went to her home, and I said all the same things. And I spoke all the same things, and I looked at her eyes, and I said everything I could, did everything I could to try and stir faith. Prayed for her because I thought I'd better. And nothing happened. The ingredients weren't in place for the miracle. 
when we pray for people we want to know they're ready to receive otherwise we're going to reinforce their unbelief was in a meeting years ago in a was it a bowling club in a place called Echuca in Australia up on the Murray River and I went down the line praying for people and things were happening and I got to this guy who was standing there with his arms folded like whatever you see that see that look and I walked to him and it was like hmm, have a shot and the Lord said don't touch him I said sir I'm not praying for you he said why not I, said, I feel the Lord told me not to pray for you but to say go away and fast and pray and open your heart up to God you got some stuff to deal with yourself before I do you're not ready and then I thought what have I said to this guy now normally I would have gone down even though his body language was terrible I would have laid my hands and cried out to God and tried hard and prayed hard and done my best and probably in the flesh cried out and hoped God was going to do something and hoped God had come to my rescue but God doesn't come to the rescue he responds to faith He responds, and it's very quick. I've found that the great miracles we've seen over the years have almost been so quick that you go, did that really happen? And I've had an awful lot of nights praying and crying out. I used to go home from meetings as a young man, praying for little kids with muscular dystrophy and stuff, crying out until I was just about in despair and going back to my room so despondent and so devastated, I'd sob on the inside and so I'm never praying for anybody again this is, this is killing me then other times I was over at Pastor Rodney Howard Brown's a couple of years ago a Sunday morning power of God hit like a fire one of his uh, river fests power of God hit like a fire like a fire incredible it exploded there 1408 decisions on a Sunday morning and then we prayed and they started passing the sticks and crutches over the top of the crowd. I finished up with nine walkers and crutches and sticks and things in my arms. I couldn't hold anymore. The guy next to me had a bundle and they kept passing them. I thought, this is America. This is America. Other days you pray and you might as well be praying in a museum to all the stuffed animals. I'm speaking long tonight but that's what we're here to do to share we're not here to just have a short meeting we're here to have a feed on the word tonight and so I said to this guy go and fast and pray a couple of days he went out of there and he said ah he said I might do that anyway but he said I got bowls on Sunday night and we were in the bowls place but he was going to be playing out in the rink well somebody left the sprinklers on so he came to church but something happened in those two days God dealt something with him and I walked towards him and as I walked towards him I felt the Lord say rebuke bitterness because bitterness will bind you up bitterness person that gets very bitter open themselves to arthritis open themselves to all sorts of things the body is not geared to handling guilt bitterness or unforgiveness any of those things the body can't deal with them that we don't have It'll manifest in different ways. There's things that the body's not naturally made to handle. It'll, they'll manifest themselves out in different ways. I walked towards him and the Lord said, spirit of bitterness. And I said, you spirit of bitterness. With that, this guy went about six feet straight, straight to the side of the platform. Bang. And got up, jumped around, started hugging people, throwing his arms in the air completely healed and the Lord said to me two nights ago three nights whatever it was he said if you had prayed for him you would have just put another blanket and another layer of unbelief over him making it much harder for the next time but you waited 
until you heard from me and you moved in my timing. There's some real keys here. Some real keys to healing here. To, to real keys for you one on one to lead someone to Christ, to lead someone to their miracle. First one is if we spend time in the word feeding on what the Bible says about divine healing and the power of God and the supernatural and we feed on who we are in Christ and what we are and what we have and what we carry and, and everything about authority and everything about power that is ours. Well, something's going to build within us because our faith will grow. And as it comes out of our mouth, it'll become the distomos, the two-mouthed sword. But then... After we've got the word burning in our spirit, we need to then have eyes to watch and look to find. Eyes that are geared to searching out where people are at. And then we need perception to know when a situation is right. We need the word. We need open eyes to watch intently. And then we need to have perception to know when to pounce. And when we hit that moment where they all line up, where we've shared the word, where the word's been shared, where the person you can tell by their eyes and their body language and you've watched them and you watch their reaction until suddenly you perceive they are right, then you speak. And right at that point you'll find you have an authority that's not your own and you just simply say to them, Stand up! Move your arm. Test your back. Take it now. It's like a cake. It's got the ingredients. The Word of God. The watching eyes. Learning to seriously observe what's happening in the Spirit. You'll see something in the Spirit. You'll see things. When you're moving at the altar... Sometimes Pastor Mark will pray for someone there or someone there or go there or do something here or pull back or go for a group there or walk up there or do something. I, I'm watching all the time. Where's it hot? Where can I sit? Sometimes you see, the per sometimes you see a person's face just stands out. Sometimes it's like there's something over them. Sometimes they, you, you can't explain it. There's just something about that person that you are gravitated to that you just feel you have to lay hands on them. And God says, move there, move there. Do this, do that, work there, work there, do this. And it becomes something quite supernatural. Quite supernatural. The word, the timing... perception for the timing and then the declared word of power the spoken word of authority in his name and in that moment when faith is quickened the power of his word and the authority to speak into that situation in his name and see the victory hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus, we thank you tonight. We thank you tonight. We thank you tonight. What's our responsibility? What's my responsibility as a preacher? What is it? My responsibility as a preacher is to preach the word of God that you spend enough time in 
that you're not spitting grass, but you, you've let the word grow. And sometimes when you've been preaching a lot of years, the word does become very living within you. The, 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 the miracles become very living. And I think as you've preached over the years and you've preached hundreds and hundreds of times from all of those miracles, and it becomes very dynamically real to your spirit. And I think as you preach, something happens. But if we're new, new and we're just stepping in, what, what do we do? We feed on the Word. And we take everything we can find on healing, everything. I was going to tell you a story before. A lady in Australia had been involved with the bikers. Um, they thought that she had put them into the police. They beat her to pieces and then shot her and a bullet lodged in her spine and she was paralysed. From virtually she had one arm that moved slightly and uh, virtually no movement apart from one arm. She could do a little bit with her head. She had her faculties but there was a bullet lodged there somewhere and, and she was... Uh, basically paralyzed not totally but very very close and she came into a meeting like this we prayed for her reached out to God preached the word prayed for her you say did she get healed no she didn't but I went up to her afterwards and the Lord said to me she needs to be drenched in the word drench her in the word and I gave her all the CDs I had I had packs of them then and I gave her a whole wad of stuff and I said look Listen to these. Feed on the word. Read the word. Feed on the word. Feed on the word. Just feed on it. Just let the word dwell richly. Let the word get down in here. Faith's going to come with the word. Faith's coming by hearing. Listen to it. Feed on it. Read your Bible. Listen to everything you can on healing. And she did. About three months later, she was in church and she was loaded with the word of God. And she was in the wheelchair and she lifted up her arm and suddenly her arm went straight up. The other arm went and she stepped out of the wheelchair. She's never been back in it since. Never been back. You say, who did the miracle? Who did the miracle? Jesus is the miracle worker. But he says, use my name, use my power. But sometimes I have people come and say, would you go to the hospital and pray for this sick person? You go and raise them up. Will you come and pray for them? I say, what do they know about the word? Well, nothing. They're hoping for something. Have you been giving them, sitting down by them, and talking to them about the healing power of God. No. But you expect me to walk in there, just raise them up. I said, well, what about if you do the preparation? And then why don't you pray? Why don't you sit there and start to talk to them about what the Bible says about healing? Because that same word in you will work the same as that word in me and it'll stir the same faith that I would stir doing the same thing and then the Bible says these signs shall follow them that believe why don't you then be a believer and lay your hands on it because we feel like because a person has been used a lot in that area or had the, the opportunity to preach a lot that they're just going to just walk around it's just everywhere well I think there's the principle of the hearing of the word the stirring of faith the quickened moment or the moment when the father says move right there just close your eyes for a moment let's stand together Has that stirred something in your spirit tonight? Stirring faith in your spirit? Nothing's impossible. And a brother back there in a wheelchair and nothing's impossible. We're going to gather around and pray for him in a moment. It's in a meeting like this we can go, okay, Pastor Tim, let's see what you can do. I think... We want to see what Jesus can do. And I think we want to unite our faith because the Bible says if two or three shall agree on anything here on earth, be done in heaven. And if we can agree tonight, then a miracle's going to happen. A miracle's going to happen. A miracle's going to happen. Yes, 
Holy Spirit. I want you just as you're standing there right now to say, Father, no, 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 just, just in your own, just quietly, just reach out to him and say, Look, Lord, if you, would you just show me some conditions here in the room? Would you show me a condition in someone's body right now? Would you show me a condition in their body that needs to be healed? Holy Spirit. We just become aware of conditions. There's a lot of conditions here. The serious conditions and minor conditions. I'm just really conscious of about four people that have acid reflux, that have hiatus hernia or acid reflux. You get a lot of rising of acid and you need a miracle. If that's you, give me a wave. You have acid, get, that acid, get a lot of acid. You need a, a breakthrough. Would you give me a wave? Just give me a wave if that's you. If you have an acid, acid reflux, would you lift your hand? I'm just conscious of that, so I'm calling that because I'm conscious. Is there someone with that? Just come, if that's you. I'm just aware of digestive stuff, and that's what I'm feeling. Feeling, a, might be me with a bit of acid at the moment, but I'm just aware of like acid reflux. I call it hiatus hernia, I think. Who's got that tonight? Just lift your hand if that's you. Spirit of the Lord. He's here to touch... Problems right through the building. But we want to move as one tonight, as one person. Just as one. We just want to move as one. Sister, Spirit of the Lord's on you. Just come here, this sister in the second row. Right here. Right here, this one. Come here. Come up. Yes, this lady, right here. So I've got some bent football fingers from football and they don't always point that straight. Jesus, let the anointing go right through her body. Right through her body. Anoint her. Anoint her. Anoint her. Anoint her. Anoint her. Anoint. Anoint.
Heavenly Father, we thank you. If you need a miracle right now, step into the aisle. Would you do that? Don't come to the front. Just step in the aisle. That just the aisle. That's it. You need a miracle. I want, I want some people to stand with our brother back there on the bed. A couple of guys full of the Holy Ghost go back with him. Would you do that? And then I want Christians to gather around each one of these guys here in the middle. I want you to gather around them. Just go to them. Snake, you should be in there. Go and pray for a couple. You're in. That's it. Lay hands on them. Now listen. We are God's ministers of healing to the nations. The healing power of God is right through this building. If we can just receive it. If we can just receive it. Not just receive the power of God, but receive the miracle in our body. The Bible says if two or three shall agree as touching anything on earth, anything, anything. I didn't say that. The Bible says that. The Bible says if you've got faith as a grain of mustard, so you say to that mountain, get up and go into the sea and you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe that what you say is going to come to pass, you'll have whatsoever you say. Am I not the God of all flesh? Is anything too difficult for me? Nothing. Nothing is too difficult. Nothing. 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 Now, this is what we're going to do. We're all going to pray this prayer together. Every one of us. And we're going to declare the healing power in their bodies. And we're going to believe God. They're going to believe God. And if our faith and their faith and the power of the Word of God and the presence of God in the building unite and quicken together, there's a miracle. There's a miracle. God responds to faith. He responds somehow, somewhere to faith. So I want you to do this. Number one, number one, we're going to pray together. We're going to declare the healing power of God. Number two, when we've finished, we're going to shout. The Bible says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. And then as we shout, as we're shouting unto God, and be prepared to shout until we feel something break. Then as you're shouting, I'm going to challenge people, do something you couldn't do. As we're declaring the victory, I want you to begin to move that part of your body. Begin to do something you couldn't do. Begin to believe that as we've prayed and as we've shouted in thanks, that right at that moment, something's going to happen and start to act your faith. Start to act it. Start to act it. Start to act it. Do something you couldn't do. You couldn't lift your shoulders, lift them up. Couldn't move your arms, move them about. There's something you couldn't do, start to do it. Start to do it. People around you will help you do it. Are you ready right now? Are you ready? Are you ready? We're going to pray. We're going to shout. We're going to act. Pray, shout, act. Pray, shout, act. You ready? Father, we come to you. In the power of the name of Jesus. We thank you that you are the God of all flesh. With you, nothing's impossible. And Lord, you've given us authority to use your name. And you said you'd back it. You'd brood over it. Father, in Jesus' name, right now, let healing flow. Miracle power now. Miracle power now. 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 
now, 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 right back there, now, hallelujah, pray for them now, pray for them now, pray for them, break the power, break the power, hallelujah, Hallelujah! 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Start to move that part of your body that you couldn't move. Start to move it. Start to bend it. Test it. If you're short of breath, breathe in deeply. Move that leg. Move that knee. Test that body. Test your body. Test your body right now. Move it. Move it. Move it about. Check it. Check it. Check it. Check it. Test it. Feel it. Move it. Do something you couldn't do. Do something you could not do. Do something you could not do. Do it like you own it. Do it like you want it. Do it like it belongs to you. Do it right now. Do it right now. Take your healing. Take your healing. Take your healing. Hallelujah. How are you doing? Good. 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 Who's been healed? Who's had a healing of something? Give me a wave if God touched you. If you've had a healing of something, come down here. Just come down here. If God just touched you, come down here. Everyone that's had a healing, come right down here. Just stand across like me, facing about that way. Anyone else had your healing, you know it. Just come. Anyone else, you've had a healing, would you come? Anyone else? Just come. Just come right down this way. Come right down this way. Anyone else? Just come. Just come. Just come. Good job. Good job. Anyone else? Anyone else? You've had a healing of something, just come. Just come. I tell you, the power of God's here. Power of God's here. That's where we stretch out. Power of God's present to heal. Power of the Lord. Now, there's people back there with major conditions. Give them room, actually, back there. Don't crowd them. Just give them room. And we're going to come and we're going to pray for them in a moment. But I tell you, we just find out what's happened on a small scale. Let our faith rise to a bigger scale. What's happened, sir? What happened? Sick, so it was hard for me to breathe without a coughing fit every time I breathed. You've had a coughing fit, you've been struggling to breathe. How is it now? You're healed. You're healed. You're healed. What's happened, sister? What's happened? Are you seeing? Pardon? Have you been healed tonight or you've come for healing? Okay. What's happened, champion? Pardon? A mattress fell on you. Come up here on your back. And? Don't be shy. Come in. And it's healed? Pain's all gone? When did that happen to you? A few days ago. Just right now, you had a mattress fall on you. No, a while ago. How long has it been bad? been hurting all day. God's touched you. I love that. God bless you. There's a little things. I rejoice in little things. I rejoice in little things. What's happened? I have chronic back pain. For how long have you had chronic back pain? Since kindergarten. Since kindergarten. What happened to your back? It's completely fine. What was wrong with it before? It was super weak and achy all the time. 24 
Is this the first time you've been free of pain with it? Since kindergarten. Since kindergarten. Can you touch your toes? Do something you couldn't do. Show me what you couldn't do. Could you do that when you came in? You couldn't do that when you came in. You've had a miracle in your back. Since kindergarten. Since kindergarten. Since kindergarten. Since kindergarten. Since kindergarten. Since kindergarten. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. What's happened? I just had like a sore throat and like stuffy nose and felt kind of feverish. How do you feel now? It's so good. It's feeling good? Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's a miracle. What happened, sir? Um, before I used to have a uh, blurry vision, but now I can see clear. You had blurry vision and now it's clear. Very bright. See, your eyes have had a major healing. Hallelujah. 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 You know, you know, I, right now, we've got some major things here. But I've learned something. Rejoice in the little and God will give you the big. Now, that's a miracle in our brother's eyes. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. A cold, it's good to have a rotten throat and fever and stuff. That's a miracle. Peter's mother-in-law had a fever. Jesus raised her up and it was enough of a miracle to be recorded forever. As a fever. Right? I'm sure there were greater things but the Bible records Peter's mother-in-law had a fever. Miracle. It's a healing. It's a miracle. I've learned that if I'm excited, and see, the skeptic will sit in a meeting like this and say, ah, oh, yeah, headache, toenail. And I, I was with a young guy. We are over in Vanuatu. In the first couple of days, things were just starting to happen. And the kids are out there and they were rejoicing because they maybe got a, a little miracle. And he was sitting there going, wow, you talk about healing. What about the big things? What about the big miracles? What about the people that come into the meeting in wheelchairs and stuff? And what about that? And he was cynical. And I said, you're cynical of them. They've been having a crack at getting a miracle. And they've had a few little things. And you sit in judgment. I said, you're sitting on your backside doing nothing in judgment. I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Get in and join them. I said, you get out there with them on the street and stop sitting back judging. Get your backside up off the seat and get out there and dare to believe God. The next few nights, it was the following night, 35 deaf, deaf people brought up on the platform. Three of them mute, three from birth. We'd had a little, few little things happen the previous day. I prayed for the first two. The first one was hard as nails. And I thought, if this doesn't break, we're going nowhere. And I battled with that deaf ear until the deaf ear opened up. And I said, thank you, Jesus. Prayed for the next one. It was easy. And I think I told you last night, the third one, I said to a young man from, uh, he's from Texas. His name's Tucker from Texas. And I said, Tucker, do you believe this, this girl can get a miracle? He said, yes, sir. I said, get up here. He laid hands. She got a miracle. By the time we finished, there were 35 deaf people who had been healed. Every one of them. Three deaf mutes. The pastor who organized the crusade, his daughter had been deaf and, and mute from birth. And from that point on, the city filled with the miraculous. And that young man was changed. And he said to me, thank you for speaking to me like that. And the people probably sitting in this meeting right now in judgment going, ah, uh, yeah talk big, 
talk about all these miracles. Where's the big miracles? This guy's still on the bed back there. Someone's still in a wheelchair there. Sit in judgment. See, in a meeting like this, when everyone's in agreement, God says, I'll honor that. We sit in judgment, you can feel it in the air. You feel it in the air. When Jesus raised the dead, he put the unbelievers out of the room. Put their darkness and unbelief and cynical attitude and said, get out the door. Put them out. In fact, he only took three in that dared to believe. Nine of the disciples spent most of their time outside. He took with him Peter, James and John. Because Peter was a man who dared to step out in the water. John was a man of intimacy in the spirit. And James must have been a goer because he was the first martyr. He didn't put Thomas in. Because Thomas sat there in judgment. You say we've had a few little things happen tonight. No, we've had some good things happen. And you know, the night's not over tonight. The night's not over and we're going to spend time with each one of the people here that need a major miracle. And we're going to believe God for them. We're going to believe God for them. Holy Spirit, I've learned something over the years. There was a famous preacher and he prayed for a lady in a meeting and she died. Shortly after he prayed, she died. And the devil, and then a few nights later, he prayed for some more critically ill people and they died. And the devil said, what are you going to do now? And he said, if they come tomorrow night and I have to step over four dead bodies, I'll do it. And if I have to step over five the next day, I'm going to keep going until everybody in the building gets healed. And there's an attitude with healing. And you see, a blind man came to Jesus and he prayed for him. And he said, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees walking. And he prayed again. And he got healed. And Jesus had to pray twice. And there's people who's still waiting for healing here tonight. Would you give me a wave? You're still waiting? Okay. Where are you? Where are you? Come up here. Come up here. Come up here. Is that, is that bed mobile? Is that, that wheelchair mobile there? Bring our brother up. We're going to pray for him tonight. We're going to minister to him. God bless you, sir. What's happened to you? Pardon? A car accident. And what have you done? Broken a few things? When did you have the accident, bro? Back in 13. Have you had any breakthrough in your body to this point? No change yet? You know, I said yet. 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 You love Jesus. Probably in a car or a motorbike or in a car. And then suddenly your life changed. Everything changed. I don't want to see you in that thing. I don't see you in that thing. Jesus. Jesus. What's your name? Emmanuel. It's a good name. God with us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says if Jesus moved with compassion, he healed the sick. And I pray for people and they don't get their miracle. I go home and say, Father, come on now. We, I want to press in harder after you. Over the years, we've seen just about everything happen. I prayed for a lot of people who have had great miracles. I prayed for a lot, didn't see anything. I prayed for some that were instantly healed, some that were healed later, some that may still not be healed. But every time I get a chance to pray for someone, I believe God with them. I want something to happen for you tonight. First miracle I ever saw was a man who'd had a stroke. And he was paralyzed down one side of his body. 
And this is really probably the second miracle. First one was a guy's teeth was healed in a Baptist, in a Baptist home fellowship. He had his teeth absolutely, the lady I think it was, had a teeth completely restored and the dentist didn't recognize him. And then I, that got my attention. <laughs> then I got called to a church and I preached. I preached on the cross. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquity. The well-being of his peace is upon you, upon him. By his wounds, you were healed. He was wounded for you. I preached on that. And they came out, and I was hoping for a couple of minor headaches and an ingrown toenail. But a guy came out paralyzed down one side of his body on a walker. And I'll be honest with you, back there, and I still, it's still the whole thing, I'm looking for that quickened moment. When I'm not moving in hope and we're moving to a point where we know the triggered faith. And I began to pray for him and I had a hand on his stomach. And I had a hand on his stomach, I was praying for him, I wasn't, I wasn't looking. The next thing I felt water running down, warm water landing on my arm. And he's crying. And he said, I can move this. And in that meeting, he lifted it about that far. And I, and I felt the Lord say, that's the cloud the size of a man's hand. Tell him to go home and start moving. He had thrown his walker away and he was healed in three weeks. And I prayed for others. I looked for the quickened moment. And God's hand is on you. And, you, and you've weathered a storm, haven't you? You've weathered a storm. Father... I want some anointed men and women just to come with us. Just take Emmanuel by the hand. And just declare, Emmanuel, whatever we can believe for tonight, we're going to believe for change. I'm believing you, believing tonight for change, for movement in your body. Father, right now, right now in the name of Jesus, let your healing power go right through his body, Father. Let your healing grace come upon him. We declare restoration of this spine, restoration of his spine, restoration of his spine. Restoration of his spine. Restoration of his spine. Total healing down that spine. Let movement come. 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 come. In his hands. In his feet. Father, touch him. Touch him. In his hands, in his feet, feeling, movement, movement, movement. Let me pray for you. What are you suffering? Jesus, Jesus, all over the building, give God a great clap offering. Give him a great praise offering. Hallelujah. 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 You know, if you've got pain in your body, who's got pain in their body right as we speak? Come here. Come here. Come here, sir. Lift your hands up to God. Where are you suffering? In your toe. Lift your hands up to God. Go.
Move it about. Wriggle it. Who else in pain right now? Who else in pain? Just come. Who's that back there? Just come. Okay. Where is she? Put your hands on it. Put your hands on it and pray for her. Put your hands on it right there. Pray for her. Just right there. You guys pray. You guys pray right now. You guys pray. Touch her. Healing power. Healing power. Healing power. Amen. 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 If you're sick in your body, wherever you are, you still need a miracle, take it now. Move it now. Take it now. Take it now. Take it right now. Take it right now. Take your healing. Take your healing. Take your healing. Take your healing. Amen. Well, folks, I want you to do something just for a moment. We're right with you, Manuel. We're right with you. Do you feel anything right now? Anything? You're feeling something? Any change? Any movement? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to believe with you that the whole congregation here is going to be praying for you. And be praying for you. Be praying for you. I'm a great believer. I'm a great believer that don't let anything discourage you. Let it push you. Over many years, I've learned to take yesterday's failures and difficulties and turn them into fertilizer for tomorrow's successes and victories. And let, let Emmanuel's situation push us to another level. Let Emmanuel's situation push us, and some of the folk that need big miracles tonight, push us to another level. And get hold of your word. I want to challenge you to take some of what we've shared. It's been fairly practical. And go home and feed in that word. Hunger in that word. Hunger for the miracle power. And the word that just goes through my spirit right now is pursue love, yet earnestly desire the spirituals and desire them all. Especially you might prophesy to heal, to see the demonstration of God. I hope these few days have been a help. I hope it's been a blessing to you. you you always a blessing to me and I hope, I really feel that you know, as, as I've been teaching the Word, it's been greatly helping me. Especially last night, I felt God really quickening my spirit tonight. A lot of little pearls. Go looking for the pearls. Look for the pearls of faith. It'll quicken you to another level. Did you get something out of this, Rob? Did you get some stuff? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Lift your hands. Rob. Oh, God, touch him right now. Fire on your rock. Oh, it's all over you. He and Randy are two people that I just love. I just love. Pray for him, Randy. Pray for him. Pray for him, Randy. Yeah. That's not Randy. That's Rob. Pray for him. Go and pray for him. Go and pray for him. Go and pray for him. That's it. Let it flow. Let it flow, Rob. Let it flow. Let it flow. Let it flow.
So this eye is blind, is it? See this one? Father, healing power. Healing power. Filled. Right through the building. Lift up your hands. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Give the hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm pretty done. I'll see you in a year or something. We'll be back. Love you. Love ministering to you tonight. Thanks for coming. You all happy? Good night. God bless you. See you soon. God bless.